Hello students, today we will discuss about the anatomy of palatine tonsil. Palatine tonsils are also known as tonsil. So whenever you are having the word tonsil, or every time we are meaning the tonsil means we are talking about the palatine tonsil. Now when you will see the palatine tonsil, these are the paired structure. Now where you will find the palatine tonsil, palatine tonsils are present in the oropharynx and it is commonly known as the tonsil. Each tonsil is a almond shape mass of lymphoid tissue. So this is the important thing about the shape that when you will see the lymphatic nodules or the lymphatic collection in your oropharynx which is known as palatine tonsil. These are almond shape mass and these mass are present into a triangular fossa and that fossa is known as tonsillar fossa. Now tonsillar fossa are present on both right and left wall of your oropharynx. It is present between the anterior pillar and the posterior pillar of your tonsillar fossa which is also known as fossis. Then the anterior pillar is formed by a muscle which is known as palatoglossus. If you remember the class of my uh, this tonsil, we have discussed the oropharynx feature. In that class of the oropharynx, I already told you about these features of your tonsillar fossa where you have the palatoglossal arch anteriorly and palatopharyngeal arch in the posterior part. Now in this diagram also you can see that this is your anterior arch and this is your posterior arch. In between you are having a gap and that gap contains the tonsil. So this part is having the tonsil which is lined anteriorly by this arch which is having the palatoglossal connection and this arch is containing palatopharyngeal muscle. Then in this diagram also if you will see that this is your anterior pillar. Now this anterior pillar is a very important landmark because this anterior pillar separates the oral cavity from oropharynx. Now once you are able to see that the pillar is a demarcation line so automatically this tonsillar fossa become the part of oropharynx not the oral cavity. So this is the important thing which you always is, uh, keep in mind that tonsils are not the contents of oral cavity they are contents of your oropharynx and the oropharynx starts from this anterior pillar of your tonsillar fossa. Now what are the boundaries of tonsillar fossa? Specifically anterior boundary, posterior boundary, apex, base and lateral boundary. Anterior boundary is formed by the palatoglossal arch which contains the palatoglossal muscle. Posterior boundary is formed by palatopharyngeal arch which contains the palatopharyngeal muscle. Apex, if you will see the apex, apex is facing towards the soft palate. This is the soft palate. Here you will have the meeting point of anterior and posterior pillar and this apex is touching towards the soft palate while the base is going towards the dorsum of tongue. So this is the tongue and this is the base. So if you will see this triangular fossa, the fossa is having anterior wall is formed by the anterior pillar, posterior wall is formed by the posterior pillar, apex towards the soft palate, base towards the tongue and then you will have the lateral wall and lateral wall is also known as tonsillar bed that is a separate short note for your exam so that we will discuss in the coming part of this lecture. So in this diagram also you can see when you will open the mouth and see in the mirror this is your midline structure is known as uvula from the uvula you are having the anterior pillar and you are having the posterior pillar now in between them you will have this enlarged almond shape structure is known as palatine tonsil. So what are the external features of tonsil? Now when you will have the palatine tonsil you are going to see the two surfaces. One surface is facing towards the oropharynx, one surface is attached towards your pharyngeal wall. So the surface which is facing towards the oropharynx is the medial surface, surface which is attached towards the wall is known as lateral surface. Then you will have the two poles, when you will have the almond shape structure, this is known as upper pole, this is known as lower pole and you are having the two borders, 
one is become anterior border one will become posterior border so in this diagram also you can see that this is your anterior pillar so the border which is facing towards the anterior pillar suppose this is your almond shape structure so this will become anterior border this will become posterior border this will become upper pole this will become lower pole of palatine tonsil so what are the features of different surfaces first we'll talk about the medial surface now medial surface is the surface which is going to face towards the oropharynx we are using the word oropharynx again and again not the oral cavity which you also keep in mind because the tonsil is a feature of oropharynx not the oral cavity another important thing is that oral cavity is lined by non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium and that squamous ep non keratinized epithelium continue in the oropharynx and that also lies this medial surface of your tonsil on the medial side of the tonsil there is a very important feature that is known as crypts of the tonsil now when you will see this diagram you can see that there are multiple invaginations from the medial side now these invaginations are known as crypts of the tonsil these crypts are also lined by the non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium there are around 15 crypts so there are 12 to 15 openings are seen on the medial surface of your tonsil and these uh, crypts are uh, also showing the branching and the branching is going to form the secondary crypts so the major crypt is known as primary crypt and their branchings are known as secondary crypt now one of the crypt situated near the upper pole now this is the important question for your exam this is our upper pole this is our lower pole the crypt which is situated near the upper pole become large and this largest crypt is known as this large these largest crypts are there and the crypt which is near the upper pole is known as crypta magna so what is the question about crypta magna the first question is where you will find crypta magna answer is crypta magna is present on the medial surface second what is the position it is near the upper pole of tonsil it re what this crypts represent the it represent the remnant of the ventral portion of second pharyngeal pouch this is pouch so so this is again the important thing which you have to keep in mind when you are going to see the embryology development of head and neck you are going to deal with the pharyngeal arches and the pouches so the second pharyngeal pouch remnant is going to show the adult derivative and that is known as crypta magna from the many main crypt there is a second crypt arises so these second crypts are nothing but these are the branching of the primary crypts and these crypts will fill with the cheesy material food particles and sometimes with the epithelial cells bacteria and this these crypts are feature of or i should say the characteristic feature of your palatine tonsil which are lined by non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium so when you are reading the medial surface of the tonsil the most important characteristic feature is presence of crypts and the largest crypt is known as crypta magna now when you will see the lateral surface the lateral surface of the tonsil is attached to the your pharyngeal wall and that is actually the area where you will have the half capsule and that's why you will have the feature is known as hemi capsule that means if you will see the oropharynx in the oropharynx both side you will have the roughness of the medial surface because of the crypts its lateral surface is smooth and this lateral surface is covered by half of the capsule the capsule is present but it is only half because the medial side capsule is absent on the medial side the tonsil is lined by non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium not by any kind of capsule so this is the characteristic feature that lateral surface of the tonsil is having a fibrous capsule but only on the half of the portion and that's why it is known as hemi capsule of the tonsil now between the capsule and the bed of the tonsil there is a loose connective tissue is known as peritonsillar space now this space is a easy space for the dissection at the time of tonsillectomy 
what is tonsillectomy removal of the tonsil from the tonsillar bed so when you are doing the tonsillectomy which place is used it is answer is peritonsillar space it is also the site of the collection of the pus and that is known as peritonsillar abscess so when you are talking about the lateral surface the most important feature of the lateral surface is hemi capsule of the tonsil then when you are going on the lateral side you will have a number of the structure and all these structure commonly known as bed of the tens tonsil now when you are talking about the bed of the tonsil you should know that when we are talking about the formation of the wall of pharynx the uppermost constrictor is known as superior constrictor and the tonsil is present just inside the superior constrictor so the main contribution on in the bed of the tonsil is by the superior constrictor muscle and some contribution comes from the styloglossus now in this diagram also you can see that this is your superior constrictor now you can see that superior constrictor muscle is present in both the side of your pharynx so this is your pharyngeal tube and in this tube you can appreciate that this is your superior constrictor muscle anterior end of the superior constrictor attached to here you can see this is your pterygo mandibular raphe anterior to the raphe you will have the buccinator muscle so here you can see in the posterior part there is a ring shape half ring shape superior constrictor now on the inner side of the superior constrictor you can see that this is the location of your palatine tonsil between the arch this anterior arch is known as palatoglossal arch and this posterior arch is known as palatopharyngeal arch so the this is the important concept which you have to keep in mind that whenever we are talking about the bed of the tonsil only muscle which comes always in picture is superior constrictor now you know that when we are talking about the layers of the pharynx you have the mucosa then you will have pharyngobasilar fascia then you will have muscle layer and then outside you have buccopharyngeal fascia so here also if you will see that this is our superior constrictor inside the superior constrictor we have the layer and that layer is known as pharyngobasilar fascia outside this pharyngobasilar fascia this fatty layer is known as buccopharyngeal fascia so all these three layer are actually forming the lateral relation of the palatine tonsil or you can say the bed of tonsil so whenever you are reading the bed of the tonsil you have to first talk about the superior constrictor apart from that the glossopharyngeal nerve and styloid process lies in the relation of the lower part of tonsillar fossa the both these structures can surgically approach through the tonsillar bed after removing the tonsil that is tonsillectomy so once you will remove this tonsil through this space if you will approach outside the pharynx you can reach to the glossopharyngeal nerve and styloid process so the tonsillar bed is mainly contributed from inside out first is pharyngobasilar fascia superior constrictor and buccopharyngeal fascia so these are the three layers of the pharyngeal wall which are on the lateral side of palatine tonsil but there is a long list of the structures which are present in relation to the tonsil before that if you will see in this diagram you can see that if we will take a section at the level of palatine tonsil and if you will see here you can see that this is the attachment of your superior constrictor now inside this superior constrictor on inner side you will have this almond shape relation of your palatine tonsil so palatine tonsil is lies just inside the superior constrictor muscle and you know that constrictor's inner side lined by the pharyngobasilar fascia so this is the important thing which you should keep in mind so what are the structures which are lies in the bed of tonsil so outside the superior constrictor there is a long long list of the structure so when you are doing the dealing with the uh, tonsillar bed you are having the pharyngobasilar fascia outside the pharyngobasilar fascia you have the superior constrictor outside the superior constrictor you have buccopharyngeal fascia and along with buccopharyngeal fascia there is a long list of the structure which are present into that relation so the first is the facial artery 
facial artery is one of the most important component which is present into the tonsillar bed and there are two important branches of the facial artery ascending palatine and tonsillar branch apart from that you have the styloglossus muscle which is coming from the styloid process approaching the tongue running just parallel to the pharynx on outer surface along with the glossopharyngeal now some part of submandibular salivary gland posterior belly of digastric muscle medial pterygoid muscle angle of mandible and the internal carotid artery which is little bit far away from away from the tonsillar bad but at the time of tonsillectomy if we will go very deep in uh, in the pharynx you may damage the internal carotid artery too so when you are talking about the bed of tonsil you have to start from the pharyngobasilar fascia then you will reach to the superior constrictor muscle then you will come to the buccopharyngeal fascia and then you have the facial artery styloglossus muscle glossopharyngeal nerve submandibular part of the gland you have the part of the digastric muscle you have medial pterygoid muscle you have mandible you will have the uh, part of the internal carotid artery so in this diagram you can see that first you have to locate the tonsillar fossa so this is your palatine tonsil in the tonsillar fossa now outside this if you will come outside so this is your superior constrictor muscle and outside the superior constrictor there is a layer of your buccopharyngeal fascia so this is your buccopharyngeal fascia outside the superior constrictor now more laterally if you will come this is the mandible now inside the mandible you will have the medial pterygoid muscle so whenever you are reading the bed of the tonsil it is not only the adjacent area but tell the mandible whatever the structures are present in this space between the pharyngeal wall and inner side of the angle of mandible they all considered as a structure in the bed of tonsil so what are now what about the borders i told you there are two border anterior and posterior anterior border is coming in relation with the anterior arch that is formed by palatoglossal muscle posterior border come in relation with the posterior arch that is formed by the palatopharyngeus muscle then what is the blood supply of tonsil now there are five major sources which are supplying blood to the tonsil first is tonsillar branch of facial artery this is the major source of the blood or i should say the principal artery of the tonsil it enters through the lower pole and then it pierces your superior constrictor muscle to supply blood to the tonsil so this is the important thing when you are doing the tonsillectomy the vein and arteries are generally coming to the tonsillar bed through the piercing of superior constrictor muscle then the other source is coming from the lingual artery which is giving a branch is known as dorsal lingual branch then you will have branch from the one more branch of facial artery is ascending palatine artery then you will have branch from the external carotid artery that is known as ascending pharyngeal artery and then you will have branch from the maxillary artery that is known as descending palatine artery or greater palatine artery this is a very classical picture of your blood supply of the tonsil where you can see that these are the branches which are entering from different part and they are supplying the tonsil but in this list of the artery you have to keep in mind that the major supply of the blood comes from the facial artery and the branch is named as tonsillar branch of facial artery then if you see this diagram in this diagram also you can see that this is our external carotid artery now this external carotid artery is giving the branches here you can see that this is the artery which is reaching inside and then it will supply the blood to the tonsil and if you will see the branch it is ascending palatine artery and this muscle is your superior constrictor muscle which is arising from the pterygomandibular raphe so this is artery present on the outer side that is in the tonsillar bed then along the upper border it will enter inside ascending palatine artery enter inside in the pharynx and then it will supply the blood to your uh, palatine tonsil apart from that this is your facial artery now this facial artery is giving the branches and these branches will go and supply the tonsil from its lower part so this is the important thing which you have to keep in mind 
about the blood supply of your tonsil. Then we'll have the venous drainage. Now, whenever you are talking about the venous drainage, always keep one word in your mind and that is known as paratonsillar vein. Paratonsillar vein is the largest venous channel which is draining the blood from the tonsil and ultimately this paratonsillar vein drain into the pharyngeal venous plexus. So, there is a first formation of the plexus of the vein around the tonsil. These plexus veins will form the paratonsillar vein. This paratonsillar vein ultimately join the common facial and pharyngeal venous plexus. Now, this paratonsillar vein is a large vein. At this vein, this first run or descend between the tonsillar hemicapsule and the superior constrictor muscle. Then it pierces the superior constrictor and the adjacent part of the pharyngeal wall. After piercing the superior constrictor, it ultimately opens into the pharyngeal venous plexus. Clear? So, when you are writing the venous drainage, it starts from the plexus, it ends into the plexus and the connection between these two plexus is known as paratonsillar vein. And this paratonsillar vein is the structure which pierces the superior constrictor muscle. And this vein is most common site of the hemorrhage after tonsillectomy that is known as reactionary bleeding. Now, lymphatic drainage. Now, the, there are two questions which are most commonly asked from the lymphatic drainage of the palatine tonsil. The first question is that the palatine tonsil do not possess any kind of afferent lymphatics. It is not having any input lymphatics. It is always having only the output or efferent lymphatics. Then the efferent lymphatics will come out and these efferent lymphatics also pierces, also pierces the superior constrictor muscle and ultimately it will drain into the upper part of the deep cervical group of lymph node which are particularly known as jugulodigastric group of lymph node. Now these jugulodigastric group of lymph node lies just below the angle of mandible. So whenever the person is having the tonsillitis here the collection uh, the lymphatic uh, lymph node will enlarge. So, this is the most common site of the lymph node those will get involved in case of the tonsillitis which are known as jugulodigastric lymph node and that is why these jugulodigastric lymph node is also known as tonsillar lymph node because the tonsils mainly drain into these lymph nodes. So, whenever there is an infection in the tonsil person is having the enlargement of these deep cervical lymph node just near the angle of mandible. What is the nerve supply of tonsil? The tonsil is mainly supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve. So, you have to keep this thing always in mind that whenever we are talking about the nerve supply of tonsil, it is the glossopharyngeal nerve which is not only supplying the posterior one third of tongue, which is not only supplying the posterior pharyngeal wall mucosa, but it is also supplying the palatine tonsil. Palatine tonsils are also supplied by a branch of the sphenopalatine fossa. Uh, that is the ganglia is present here and the name of nerve is lesser palatine nerve. Now, this glossopharyngeal nerve is giving the tympanic branch. That tympanic branch is known as Jacobson's nerve. That tympanic branch of glossopharyngeal will go inside the middle ear and supply the middle ear. So, because of this reason, the glossopharyngeal nerve is not only supplying the your palatine tonsil but it is also supplying the middle ear cavity. So, whenever the person is having tonsillitis, the pain of the tonsil will lead to the earache. So, the question is very commonly asked, earache is one of the symptom of tonsillitis. Why? Because the pain is referred by this ninth cranial nerve or glossopharyngeal nerve into the middle ear cavity. Then, what is the functions of tonsil? In my class of the Waldeyer's ring, I told you that Waldeyer ring is a type of mucosa associated lymphatic tissue and in that we discuss the function that these uh, lymphoids uh, aggregations which are present in the uh, uh, upper end of your respiratory system, these tissues are actually having the germinal center where you have the production of antibodies from the B lymphocytes. So, whenever the infection is occur, these infections trans, tra, uh, transmitted, these, in, in, these bacteria are carried inside these uh, lymphoid aggregations where the antibodies will destroy. So, the most important function of the tonsil is that it guard against 
the foreign introducer like virus, bacteria and other antigens coming into contact through the inhalation and ingestion. So whatever the bacteria are entering through the inhalation as, as well as through the oral cavity that is ingestion, there are two mechanisms. First, they are providing the local immunity. Second, providing a surveillance mechanism. Now, what is surveillance mechanism? That whenever a large infection is entering into the body, they will alert the body for such wider responses. Clear? So, the tonsils are very important and they are helpful in the defense mechanism. So, tonsils are most active in the childhood age. So, they are mostly activity seen in the 4 to 10 years of age. Involution begins after the puberty and resulting in decrease of the B cell production as the age advances. What is the applied anatomy? The most common problem with the tonsil is known as acute tonsillitis. That is the inflammation of the ton tonsil and the most common cause of the tonsillitis is the viral infection. It is rare in the infant and the elderly people. There is another form of the tonsillitis is known as follicular tonsillitis. Now, what do you mean by follicular tonsillitis? When you will see the tonsil, tonsil is having the three component epithelium, crypt and lymphoid tissue. Now, when the infection from the outer epithelium enter inside the crypt and then it will set inside the crypts, then it is known as follicular tonsillitis. So, in this condition, the inf inf infection is spread into the crypt. So, particularly when you are having the infection inside the crypts of the tonsil, then we are labeled it as a acute follicular tonsillitis, which becomes filled with the purulent material presenting at the opening of the crypts as a yellowish spots. Clear? So, this is the important thing about the follicular tonsillitis, which is a infection of the crypts of the tonsil. Then, this is very commonly asked question in exam that why there is a chances of the bleeding or I should say why there is a bleeding after 24 hours of the tonsillectomy. The 24 hour of tonsillectomy if the bleeding is occurring it is known as reactionary hemorrhage. Now this commonly occurs because of the damage of paratonsillar vein which we have already discussed that this paratonsillar vein is a larger vein and this vein pierces the superior constrictor muscle. So if the bleeding will occur how to control the bleeding is controlled by removing the clots of these vein. If the clots are present on the vein then you should remove these clots because what will happen that there is a presence of the clot, the clot is pre preventing the action, taping action of the superior constrictor muscle. What does it mean? If suppose we have a vessel which is passing through the muscle fiber. Now when the muscle is contracting, that contraction will compress the vessel and it is helpful in the vasoconstriction action. But when the clot will come and uh, the clot comes and they will block these veins, at that time what will happen that the action of superior constrictor is compromised. So by removing these clots, we are actually stimulating the vasoconstriction action and that is known as clipping action of the superior constrictor by the contraction of the fibers of superior constrictor muscle on the vessels which are passing through these muscle fibers. So, this is at the end of this class of the palatine tonsil, what we learn today is that what is the position of palatine tonsil, what are the different surface of palatine tonsil, what is the crypts of the palatine tonsil, what do you mean by the tonsil are bad and why there is a referred pain in the ear whenever the person is suffering from the tonsillitis. So, this is all about this class. Thank you.